Over to you. Thanks, Andrea. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Johnny. I'm very excited. Very excited to share with you what uh, we've been working on for several months now. Um, who was here for the Slugs and Bugs concert? Uh, I believe it was in May. Big hands. A decent number of you. So Slugs and Bugs is a guy, um, Randall Goodgame, uh, who lives in the States, and he sets uh, chunks of the Bible to music, and he does it in many different styles and genres and, and modes and so on. And he's been a big um, influence and inspiration to me. We've done a few uh, setting of Bible verses uh, to music here at Hope City. And um, we decided to go for a big one. Go for a big one. So I've set a whole chunk of uh, Romans, a whole, all of chapter 12 to music. And this morning you're going to hear that sung. And some of them... I'll rope you in to sing, and some of them just meditate on it. So you'll see near you or next to you, Blue Bible. If you want, you can just have that open to Romans chapter 12, and somebody who finds it first can shout out the page number. Stuart with a gold star! <laughs> Come on, brother! Say it again. 1139, nailed it. So you can just follow on along there, and I'll cue you throughout this morning when it's time uh, to join in. Now, the elephant in the room, if there isn't, I mean, there's probably several. But one is, what do you do when a song finishes? Well, we got 12 songs. So if you, if you, you, know, if you feel blessed and you feel like the best way to, to uh, express that, fine, but do not feel obliged. You know, this isn't a gig this morning where we have small egos and we need to feel good about ourselves. We are celebrating. I mean, that may be true as well, but this isn't the outlet to solve that. Um, yes, we're, 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 we're in this together, just trying it out. So uh, we're going to start out by singing uh, verse 1, Romans 12, verse 1.
Therefore I urge you Brothers and sisters In light of God's mercy In light of God's mercy Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Two verses that ask us something tough to give our whole lives to God. Serving God demands giving our whole lives to Him. To non Christians, this starts with letting Jesus lead their lives. For Christians, it means offering everything in service to God, not just a part of our lives. This can feel like a harsh joy killer. In the word that says, deny yourself nothing. The word says, if it gives you meaning, if it gives you purpose, if it gives you pleasure, just do it. Though self-denial may be a dirty word in the world, it is at the heart of personal commitment for every follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that sacrificing our will and putting God first help us to discover God's best for our lives. And so Jesus, in Matthew 16, 24 to 25, said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will serve it. But why should we give up our lives to God? And Paul answered it in the first verse where we read in Romans 12 verse 1, when he urged the Christians in Rome to offer their bodies as living sacrifices because of God's mercy. And this verse connects the practical application from chapter 12 to 16 of Romans to the earlier explanation Paul laid in chapter 1 to 11, and let's see that briefly. In 1 to 2, Paul explains that everyone has messed up, 
And the Bible calls that sin. Sin separates us from God and makes us object of his wrath. So we all need saving from sin, according to Romans 3, verse 23. This set the stage for God's mercy. And he continued to say, even though we deserve punishment, God made a way. He made it possible for us to be connected, to be made right with him through the sacrifice of Jesus. This is a gift of God's grace, showing his mercy. And Paul continued to say in chapter 6 to uh, uh, 8, that those who accept God's forgiveness and welcome Jesus into their life, God makes them part of his special family, which we call the church. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, Christians are no longer slaves to sin, but can live in a way that pleases God. This change also comes from God's mercy. And so it's not surprising in chapter 9 to 11, Paul wishes that his fellow Jews will also embrace God's mercy by receiving Jesus Christ. Just like us today, we also believe that God's merciful plan includes our friends and our loved ones who haven't yet known Jesus. So we pray for them. So when Paul urged the Christians in Rome to offer their bodies as living sacrifice, he first wanted them to recognize God's mercy, he has explained already in chapter 1 to 11. And similarly, when God calls us to offer our lives to him, it doesn't begin with us. It begins with God's mercy. He first loved us and showed that love through Jesus dying on the cross for us. Therefore, a life given to God's service is a life that recognizes mercy made everything good in us. It expresses gratitude and proper worship. And so when we, exp we express proper worship, a true worship, when we daily lay aside our desires to follow God and to put all our energy and resources at its disposal and trust in him to lead us. We do this out of gratitude that our sins have been forgiven because of God's mercy. The world often encourages us to be selfish and forget about God. But this verse tells us to think differently in view of God's mercy. When we give ourselves completely to God and let him change our thought, we will see him as a loving father who will always show mercy, who will find his plans for our life to be good, pleasing, and perfect, and not something like a burden to be carried. Therefore, we must follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave the ultimate, who showed the ultimate act of self-sacrifice to God. And in Philippians 2, 1 to 6 said, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins on the cross because of God's mercy. Therefore, the Bible teaches that Jesus' ultimate self-sacrifice to God not only saves us, but it serves as a model of our commitment to God that we should follow. So when we dedicate our entire lives to honor God, he also uses us to reach those who don't know Jesus yet. So the question is, what is God asking you to let go and surrender to him? so you can fully embrace his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. Would you honor him with less of your life when Jesus has given the whole of his life on the cross for you? Remember, we can be a blessing to many people when we give ourselves to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in view of your boundless mercy, we humbly come before you today, offering ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. 
Your mercy is beyond measure, and we dedicate our lives to honor that love. Please transform us and renew our spirit, guiding us to live in a manner that reflects your grace and goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, David. This next song is verse 2. Verse 2. the pattern of this world do not be conformed to the pattern of this Romans 12, verse 3 to 13. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serve in the Lord. Be joyful in hope. 
patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. We're going to do two songs now. And uh, I found, as a musician, I found that many people have different uh, functions with music. So some people, for example, love music as like wallpaper, as like uh, something nice in the background. And some people love music like a duvet, like something that comforts them. And some people love music uh, as a form of protest. Uh, and some people love music uh, as a way to get psyched to do three more reps or to run one more uh, kilometer or something. And uh, I've tried across these songs to, to shift the function of uh, how the song sounds, not just in its style, but its, its function, because I often find that my relationship to reading the Bible or praying can be constricted to one function, like only in this room, or only uh, before I eat a sandwich. And by changing its function, I'm trying to... Uh, to remind myself that I can engage with these words in many different modes and places. So the next two, I imagined you're in a wrestling match or a boxing match and you're like totally getting beat up and you go in the corner and your coach who's from the Bronx is just giving you the, giving you the water and giving you the rub down and saying, come on man, one more round, let's go one more round. So these are a little bit more energetic. They're a little bit more, come on, come on. So this is uh, verses three is the next one, and then going up to verse eight. Okay, here we go, wrestling match. <laughs> For by the grace given me I say to every one of you, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think. Yourself more highly than you are. Rather think of yourself in sober judgment. Do not think of yourself more highly than you are. Rather think of yourself. By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, for by the grace given me. God has 
When you hear, don't think highly of yourself, it's like you're getting beat down with a stick. And you go, okay, I quit. I quit. Or you're like totally bloated and you're hogging the space. That's just stay in the game. Stay in the game. Okay, here we go. Has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same same function. For just as each of us has one body with many members. And these members do not all have the same, same function. Same function. So in Christ we don't many from one body. From one body. And each man belongs to all the others. To all the others. According to the grace given in each of us If your If your gift is prophesying Then prophesy in accordance with your faith If, if it is serving Then serve If, if it is teaching Then teach Encourage, then give encouragement. If, if it is giving, then give generously. If, if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I don't know you, but 
I'm enjoying doing things a little differently sometimes. <laughs> um, can I ask Daniel to come up here? Uh, we are now going to pray, and Daniel is here to help us, uh, as we are going to different rooms. So can we all point our arms out? And can we all start doing our fingers? Yeah. And when I say let's pray, actually, can we do both? I can do both. Yes. And when I say let's pray, we just clap the hands together, okay? Oh, keep wiggling, keep wiggling, and let's pray. Dear Jesus, please let the kids understand the Bible. Thank you for our teachers. Amen. Amen. Kids, go to crash. And adults, if you stay here, please do interact with each other and say hello who's sitting next to you. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. God is good when we don't feel it God is good when we can't see it God is good when it's hard to believe it So let's take the time to lift up our eyes God is good all the time All the time God is good God is good all the time all the time, God is good. sing verse uh, 9 and 10 just now and uh, I imagine this one just as a very um, a beautiful lullaby sometimes when I write I write for people in mind and uh, I imagined my Rebecca singing this to our kids at night so this is uh, love must be sincere Love must be sincere Hate what is evil Cling to what is good 
be devoted to one another in love honor one another above yourself Can I just say a, a big thank you to our musicians, particularly to John, who's worked so hard to create all of this. I've been listening to Romans 12 as I drive around for the last few days, and it is just a, a remarkable piece of work. You can find it on Spotify. I would really uh, commend that to you, just to let it get stuck into your heads. I'm afraid John has a way of writing music that gets them absolutely stuck in your... I had one of my children complain, do not play me that song again because I will never be able to get it out of my head. So, I've printed without any slide change marks, so forgive me. Um, this is what we've been thinking about, um, Romans chapter 12, and uh, what does it look like as this speaks about to be a living sacrifice? What does that actually mean? What would it be like if we were transformed um, rather than being conformed? And, and what is this thing that it's ending with God's good, pleasing, and perfect will? What we've been singing and what we're yet to sing tells us what these things mean, tells us how to practice them. And it begins with thinking rightly about ourselves. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, neither having too high an opinion of ourselves, nor having too low opinion of ourselves. And in the end, both of those are destructive, and both of them are results of being conformed to the pattern of this world. Think about it. On the one hand, you have all of this, look at me, look at me, 
shouting from our world, flaunting our, our possessions, our positions, our talents, our bodies, our, our adverts relentlessly preach that this is all that matters, being the, the richest, the strongest, the, the cleverest, the funniest, the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most important. So then, if that's what is important and what matters, is it any surprise that so much of our world is filled with people trying to chase and place themselves in these categories, thinking of themselves more highly than they are? But the pattern cuts both ways. If you think about it, if all that matters, if all that is celebrated is these greats, if all the, the glory goes to the strongest, the cleverest, then who am I and what, what have I got? What can I do? I'm, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm insignificant. And that thinking too low of yourself is also equally destructive. Now, God's will, his good and pleasing and perfect will is that we would neither have too high an opinion of ourselves nor too low opinion of ourselves. But instead, God calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can finally... Think of ourselves with sober judgment is the language he uses. Think of ourselves with sober judgment. To see and understand that on the one hand, yeah, we are limited. We're, we're broken. We're worthy only of rejection and judgment. And yet at the same time to see that we can still be loved and redeemed. We can be renewed, welcomed into God's own family. Now, Beginning to think about ourselves and getting neither too high nor too low involves holding these two sides together. And the result of that is truly life-changing. It's a fundamental shift. It has implications all over the place. But I found it really interesting as I've been thinking about chapter 12 in Romans that Paul, our author, focuses on how this applies inside God's family, uh, inside the church. I wonder why he starts there and why he puts his focus there as he thinks about the outworking of not thinking too high or too low. Now, the, the picture he uses about what the church is, is is simple and yet it's profound. The church is like um, a body made up of many members, as we were singing just a moment again. Now, the, the word members has shifted in meaning a little bit over time. When I hear member, you know what I think about? I think about paying my membership fee getting my membership card, and then collecting my membership dues, right? I pay my Costco fee, I have my Costco card, I can have cheap food in quantities that are too large for any ordinary person. I pay my AA membership, and uh, I've got my AA card. When my car breaks down, I, I, I can demand that they come and rescue me. Now, that is not what Paul is getting at here when he says this body, the church, is made up of many members. That's not what he's trying to get over to us. And that's why we avoid using the term membership here at Hope City, incidentally. That's why we talk about the core instead of that. But the idea he wants to get across is that church is like, like a human body. It's just like a human body, and it's made up of many body parts, many organs, many limbs. That's not the word the word member originally means. It's like just a, it's a way of saying a part of a body, just one part. Church is made up of many parts and we are, we are different to one another. If you think about how different parts of the body are, think about how different the liver is to the eye. And that's, that's how different we are to each other. We don't have the same function. We have different capacities and different gifts. But see where he goes next. We're, we're different, but though we're many, we form one body, and each part belongs to all the others. Now, when he talks about a part belonging to all the others, he doesn't mean that you are my possession, or that I am your possession. That's, that's not the sort of belonging he's getting at. It's the sense of being joined up with. Like the original language underneath this has the sense that we're all body parts of one another. We're kind of organically connected into one another. And it's this group of people joined up into one body within the church that's where we first work out and live out the implications of this radical mind shift, not thinking too high, not thinking too low. And that's because each church, like even our church here, is where God's design for humanity, his good plan, begins to be made visible to our world. 
One song back, we had um, Ian groovily telling us uh, different gifts and those who have the different gifts, telling them to use them. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. Uh, if your gift is serving, then serve. That, that is what it looks like to live out God's good and pleasing and perfect will. Each part giving itself, playing its part for all the others. So then when you get instructions about give yourself, play your part, we have to wonder, well, what is going wrong? What, what can go wrong here? And I think, first, we can, we can hold ourselves back from others, think, I'm not going to give myself, I'm not going to play my part, perhaps because we think too low. We think too little of ourselves. We think we don't have much to offer. It doesn't matter that much anyway, the things I can do, and it won't be missed. And I wonder for how many of us that's you today. If, if I was to ask you, well, what gifts has God given you? You'd say, well, I can't play the drums like John. I can't make songs like John. I don't think I've got much at all. Or do you wish you had the gifts others have, but... Uh, are they the only ones that really matter? Well, God's message to you this morning is think of yourself with sober judgment, neither too high nor too low. We've got different, uh, different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. The text emphasizes every one of you. We don't have all the same function, but we all do have a function. And every single one matters, just like every single part of our body matters. So don't neglect the gifts you've been given. These are gifts for the, the body play your part. But that's one way we can get this wrong. The other way we can get it wrong is we can hold ourselves back from others because we think too much of ourselves, right? I can hold myself back because I, I look down on others because I, I don't think they deserve my gifts or my attention or my time or my heart. They're not worth serving. They, they shouldn't be encouraged. They don't bring anything or give anything like I do. So, they don't matter much at all. Why should I put myself out for them? Now, is that, is that you today? Have you honestly wondered whether some of those around you are worth it? Whether they're just too annoying? Have you turned your nose at them? Well, God's message to you is do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Because you and I were worthy only of rejection. And yet, God called us precious he redeemed us and brought us into his church. So how, how dare we exclude others? How dare we neglect the body that we've been made part of? But I want to give you one more way I think this goes wrong. And that is we can hold ourselves back from others just because we've grown weary. I mean, let's be clear. This is, it's hard truly giving yourselves to others. It takes energy and resources and we fear and we feel like each of those are going to run out. I'm going to run dry. And when we make ourselves vulnerable by giving ourselves to others, you can get hurt. You might be taken advantage of by someone. Now, the danger is we grow weary, and the temptation with that is we withdraw our hearts, and we withdraw ourselves. Or perhaps you've only ever just sat on the sidelines and looking and never taken the risk in the first place. Perhaps you know what it is to give yourself and you know that you've withdrawn. You probably had good reason to. Maybe you just never dared and sat on the edge and kept your distance. Church is an easy place just to sit on the edge and keep your distance and not get too involved and too exposed. But God's plan, his gift, his good design is that we're meant to be a connected body of different parts. And that means you can't remain unplugged. There is no option to be an independent eye while the rest of the body is over here. And you can't just quit on it. This is your body. You might not like it, but this is it. Your true and proper worship is how the passage described that. Last thing, what if you know you are not part of this? Well, then I want to invite you to dare to dream of what this could be. Dream of what it could be like. Imagine, imagine you are significant. You're critical. You're an essential, irreplaceable part. 
Imagine not only that, but others in the family give themselves to you. They pour themselves out for you just because you're part of the body. Now, that is what the church is meant to be because of God's transforming power. And it's a journey. It's a work in progress. We're pretty unimpressive. But that is what it's meant to be, and that is where it's going. And that is God's invitation to all of us through Jesus. So we're going to take just one minute to pray before we sing again. And in the silence, I want to invite all of us. Speak to God about what it means for you to be a part of his body, his church. And then we're going to sing once more with some encouragement about that. Serving my 
be joyful in hope patient in Okay, y'all know the next one, so can everybody stand up and sing along? Hey! You can, I know your children are driving you up the wall. Let's go. Share, share with the Lord's people who are in me. Share with the Lord's people who are in me. Third time. Share with the Lord's people who are in me. You definitely look like you want to. <laughs> share with the Lord's people who are in me. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. 
Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone with anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thanks, Susie. The sun beat down on the spectators in the Roman Colosseum. The victor paced about on the blood-soaked sand, having survived another day. The emperor, clearly impressed by the spectacle, orders the valiant fighter to remove his helmet. And he does, and the two men lock eyes. The gladiator identifies himself with a statement that remains iconic throughout films of the last couple decades. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, and loyal servant to the true emperor Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. And at this point, the color drains from the already peely-wally emperor's face as he realizes who stands before him and what this means. It's a great bit of writing, isn't it? But what's more, it underscores a reality about life in the Roman world. See, in ancient Rome, vengeance was part and parcel of life. The writing of the period, both fiction as well as historical accounts, often centered on vengeance as a core theme. It was almost part and parcel of the political transitions of power. Retribution and violence saturated the culture. Even some of the Roman deities had specialties in vengeance. And it's into this world of revenge and violence that the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the followers of Jesus who were living in the proverbial belly of the beast, Rome itself. You see, Jesus had proclaimed a different kingdom. His kingdom, a place rooted in perfect justice. Jesus spent much of his time on earth unpacking how his kingdom would look and teaching his followers how they could model the values of his kingdom in their daily lives. So Paul's words here are nothing less than completely countercultural for his Roman readers. Bless those who persecute you. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not take revenge. There's a trajectory here, and you may have seen it across the gathering so far this morning. We started with a reminder of God's mercy to those who don't deserve his mercy. We moved then with instructions for how his people should look after one another. But it doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't tell followers of Jesus to hold up in a little commune detached from the city around them. He doesn't tell them to build a fortress from which they can fight against the empire. In fact, we see... Quite the opposite. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Jesus demonstrates how to live as citizens of his kingdom. Bless those who persecute you. Jesus literally prayed for the soldiers who nailed his body to a cross. Jesus rejoiced with those who rejoiced, and he mourned with those who mourn. Remember when he stood weeping at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. Jesus wasn't proud. He absolutely was willing to associate with people of low positions, and you and I can be grateful that he did. 
He gave up the glory of heaven to step into the muck and the mire of our world, of our existence. Living as citizens of his kingdom won't always be easy. We may not live in ancient Rome, but the stumbling blocks that Paul highlighted are all too present in our own lives, aren't they? In a generally friendly liberal society, it might on the surface be fairly easy to live out the principles of Christianity. We're all nice people, after all. But behind closed doors, if we're really honest, we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to seek out what's best for those who have wronged me? Am I really prepared to bless those who persecute me? Living as a citizen of another kingdom means that we're navigating life in a disordered world. Like Ed talked about last week, it means we need to pursue radical generosity in a selfish context. Further, though, it has significant implications on our time, our actions, our plans, our families, our lifestyles. We need help. The Bible says we actually can't make it on our own. It's not in our nature to bless our persecutors. It's not in our nature to not seek revenge. And like David said earlier, it's been that way since humanity first decided to rebel against God. Fortunately, fortunately, Jesus isn't only a model for an unattainable standard. If we acknowledge and confess our inadequacies, our selfishness, our wrongdoings, and recognize that he's not only our king, but our savior. He will help us grow in grace, grow in wisdom, begin to live the kind of life we were always meant to live. That doesn't mean we'll be perfect at it, or even particularly good at it right away. Martin Luther, an influential Christian theologian, described the Christian life in the following way, and I think it's maybe a helpful way in which to wrap up this short reflection. This life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we're growing toward it. The process is not finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. The message of Jesus is not that we should keep a stiff upper lip, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, keep calm and carry on. Instead, it's to recognize that we absolutely can't do it on our own. We need God's help, and we need one another's help, too. That's what this chapter of Romans is about. It's what our musicians have been singing about, and it's what we'll be affirming when we step forward to take bread and wine in remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let's pray as the musicians come back. Lord, thank you that you didn't leave us on our own, that you gave us one another. You gave us gifts. You gave us your only son so that we could be restored in our relationship with you. Not just an end to hostility, but adopted into your family. Thank you that what was true for the church in Rome is true for us today. And help us to live as citizens of your kingdom, because we need it. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless.
It's those who persecute you, you bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not
Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be proud. But be willing. But be willing. But be willing to associate with those of low position. transition to communion and uh, I appreciate in advance grace from you all as we navigate 12 songs <laughs> What is 